like Jesus does. Today's message is called The Original Bad Girls of the Bible. <laughs> Jesus' grandmothers. Are you interested or offended? I'm used to both. Really, it doesn't bother me much. Grab one of the Bibles ahead of you. In one, of the, in one of the pews. I don't have a PowerPoint for you today because it's Thanksgiving week and I was lazy. It's hard to believe, huh? If you grab one of these pew Bibles, you're going to go to page one and it's going to be about two-thirds of the way back because it's in the New Testament. They renumber it. If you're looking it up on your phone, we're going to Matthew chapter one. And Matthew chapter one, also page number one in your pew Bible, because I want you to see this for yourselves. We're not going to be here long. Make sure you find it. When you got it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it yet, say praise God. Still looking. Or you can always do that thing where you just, if you can't find it, you just shut your Bible and you go, well, I have this one memorized, so I don't really need to read it. <laughs> right? Remember back when we used to sing hymns and you'd. You'd always have those old people who never had to open up their hymnals because they knew all the words. I always wanted to be one of those people. So I'd sit there and I'd watch the old ladies sing and I'd go, Every time I the We're just here to help, folks. Not only do I preach the sermons, I find the passages for you. Just let me know. If you need a car wash, let me know. I'll come. Page one. Oh, you really have a strange one, don't you? All right. So if you have one of these goofy ones, this will be page... I don't know what page 3,278. Something like that. <laughs> 681. Okay, everybody ready to go? This is going to be really dynamic. The genealogy of Jesus. How many of you are going, Yes! God told me to look at the genealogies this week. The record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Get ready, because this is going to get really Jewish. Bar David, bar Abraham, Abraham, Abba, Asak. What? Yes. Uh-huh. A little bit of Hebrew for you, folks. Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zariah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Dinadab, Dinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Sam, and Sam the father of Boaz, everybody say Boaz, Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, say Rahab, Rahab. Oh, uh, let's go down a little further. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. It's going to be kind of interesting. Don't let anybody ever tell you Christianity is anti-woman. The four women's names I just read for you are the only women in all recorded history of this era to have their names in genealogies. Nowhere else will you find a woman's name in a genealogy. And you find four of them here. And then Matthew's going to tell the story about Jesus in a minute. But first, he, want to clar he wants to clarify a few things. So hold on tight, because this is going to get interesting. The first woman we see mentioned is in verse 5. five. Right? Sam and the father of both. No, no, that's Rahab. Go up a little further. Verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez and Zariah, whose mother was Tamar. Are you ready for an interesting story? And I just want to warn you, this is rated PG-13 today. We're going to look at the lives of four women who became very desperate, and they got into what we would now call sexually compromised situations. Part of the reason I have no problem believing the Bible is if you read any of the other writings of any other books in the, old, in the Middle er, Near East, none of the leaders ever lost a battle. None of the kings ever lost a war. None of the leaders ever made a bad decision. Every year of their harvest was bigger than the year before, and as soon as a king got defeated, he got wiped off from the face of the history books. The Bible has no problem telling you about the problem of its heroes, and no more so than right here. And here's what you're going to notice in these stories. All of these ladies got incredibly desperate, but they used their desperation to step closer to God, not farther away. How many of you know the only thing in life you control is your choice to step closer to Jesus or not? Amen. You cannot control any person. You cannot control any situation. The only choice you really have is, am I going to step closer to Jesus or not? 
And these are four ladies who all stepped closer to God. The first person we're going to meet is Tamar. Tamar, really this is a story of Judah. Judah was one of Jacob's brothers. Now when we talk about Jacob's brothers, we know these are the ones who killed Joseph, correct? So these are not godly men. They have already slaughtered a city. Judah, who's a very important person in the history of Judaism, can you tell why? And they named it after him. He goes and he finds a wife for one of his sons, and the wife's name was Tamar. Tamar was not part of the family of faith. She was from one of the surrounding villages, and she probably grew up polytheistic, believing in many gods. But Tamar says, you're going to go and you're going to marry him up. Well, really, Jacob's, um, Judah's son takes her as a wife. This son was so ungodly, the Bible just says that God killed him. Now, think of all the people in the Old Testament God didn't just kill. Like everybody else. And you got to realize this is not a good man. Are we okay with that? And yet... Tamar, this was her first husband. So the way it works, because women didn't have any other source of income, if a husband died, they would marry the wife off to a brother, and then that woman would raise a son to her child to honor the dead relative. Well, so Judah gives Tamar to another one of his sons, and the Bible says God killed him too. So this woman has been in the family for a little while, and the only thing she has known is probably abuse at the hands of two horrific men. These guys were so abusive, God just took them. And yet, she still wanted to be a part of this family. So here comes the third son, Onan. And Onan wouldn't actually have a child with her. When it came time for the, shall we say, the, the proper moment, he would make sure that she couldn't get pregnant. So basically, he used her sexually. And he wouldn't give her a child. So finally, Judah goes, well, I got, a, I got a nine-year-old son who will grow up someday. Now think about this. What do you think all of Judah's family is thinking about tomorrow? Every guy she marries gets killed. They're probably thinking she's cursed. And yet, she so wants to be part of this family. She sees something in their monotheism that's different than the polytheism she grew up with. So she gets desperate. And then we get to one of these stories where the Bible is reporting something, not endorsing something. Are we clear? Yes. It's possible to report something and not endorse something. So don't send me emails. <laughs> Judah's wife dies. He mourns for a year. He, he's done mourning. He's ready to go out in the field and I think shear some sheep. And as he's going along, Tamar hears that he's no longer mourning and is out in the field. So Tamar decides to pose as a prostitute. Can't make this stuff up, folks. While she's st standing by the side of the road, looking like she's open for business, I guess. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Judah comes up to her, and he has this incredibly romantic pickup line. What must I pay you to come into you? Again, can't make this stuff up, folks. Okay? She says, give me a lamb or give me a sheep. And he says, okay. But she goes, but I don't trust you. Give me something as a surety. Give me something as like a deposit. So he has this cord that belongs to the family. So he gives her this cord. They go to the side of the road. They do what they do. He goes on his way, she goes on her way, but she gets pregnant. Okay. Time goes on. They discover she's pregnant. They're ready to, to stone her. Judah comes out. He calls her out. And he says to her, how did this happen? Who did this to you? And she did. She said, you did. And he goes, I did not. And she shows him the cord. And he goes, that was you? <laughs> Again, reports doesn't endorse. But guess what? She joins the family. And she's now in the line of the Messiah. When Jesus got to heaven, after he rose again, he went looking for Tamar. And guess what he called her? Booba. 
Grandma. Grandma. Because if this story teaches you one thing, it's this. It doesn't matter where you start. It only matters where you finish. Amen? Amen. So the story goes on. The next one we meet is Rahab. What do we know about Rahab? Oh, What's her job? Harlot. She's a prostitute. And where does she live? Say, on the side of the wall. Side of the wall. Oh, on the side of the wall. Good. We know that about Rahab. She's a prostitute and she lives on the side of the wall. Anybody here know what it's like to have people just know a little bit about you and then they make all their judgments based on that? So, so you got a friend in Rahab. Okay. Story of Rahab is the, the Israelites have just walked through the Red Sea. The Red Sea is closed and wiped out is, uh, Egypt. You've got to understand something. Egypt is the only superpower on the planet, and they've got completely decimated. And so while the children of Israel are walking towards Jericho, God is, is following them with a, with a cloud by day and a fire by night. Well, here's what you have to understand. The people of Jericho worship the sun. So what do you think happened when the cloud by day came? Their God got blocked. Mm -hmm. And then when they would try to sleep at night, what would they see from the distance? Fire. This gigantic fire. And it's getting closer and closer. So when the two spies come into Jericho, and yes, the two spies, when they come to Jericho, go straight to the house of prostitution. Not making this up, folks. She starts talking to him, and she says, we are terrified of what your God did to Egypt. So God has gone before them, and she says, tell you what, I will hide you here while you spy. Just remember, when, the, when you guys take us over, because she knows what they're going to do, protect me and our family. So the two spies says, we're going to do that. And she let them down through the side, and then when they came in and they ravaged the city, the first person they looked to was Rahab. Rahab eventually intermarries with the people of Israel, and guess what happens? She has a baby that's in the line of the Messiah. And so when Jesus gets to heaven, after he rises again, he's looking for Rahab. And what does Jesus call Rahab? Booba. Booba. Grandma. Because if Rahab's story tells you something, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Amen? Amen? And then the story goes on. Next one we need to talk about is Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. That means that when she grew up, she believed in multiple gods, hundreds if not thousands of them. And in Bethlehem, there's a woman named Naomi, and she has two sons and a husband. But there's no food in Bethlehem, so they decide to go with the whole family into the neighboring nation. So Ruth... Her husband, two sons, two wives go into the neighboring nation and because there's no food in Bethlehem. But when they get to the neighboring nation, there's a little problem. Husband dies. Oldest son dies. Youngest son dies. Anybody know what it's like to systematically watch everything you hoped and fall apart? So Naomi is sitting here with her two daughter-in-laws, and she says, ladies, go back, to your, go back to your home nation, and maybe you can find a husband there. And one of the daughters named Orpah said, nah, see, you don't want to be a, she took right off. Ruth, though, looks at Naomi. And again, Ruth grew up with multiple gods and goddesses. But she said, there is something in this monotheistic worship of Yahweh. Even if I've watched everything go terrible, I want to be a part of that. And she says to Naomi, the Old Testament version of the sinner's prayer, where you go, I go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That, that's as close to, to just as I am as you get in the Old Testament, folks. Okay? So she follows Naomi back. And Naomi even tries to drive her off. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Because I came out, I left the nation full, I'm coming back empty, I don't have sons, I don't have a husband. But Ruth won't leave her. Any of you know what it's like to have a connection with somebody that everybody else says, yeah, you need to leave that person? Well, guess what? Sometimes, sometimes God's going to be in that. So Ruth and Naomi kind of create a life. Now they have no money, they have a source of income, but at this time of the year they could go out to the fields. And they could glean. Now, this was the Old Testament version of welfare. If you had a field, you could go in it and you could pick your crops once 
one time through, anything that got left, the poor got to go behind and pick up behind. Mm -hmm. So as she's out there, she's, she's getting a little bit at a time, not a lot, hardly enough to live on. And then while she's out there, another man looks at her and goes, who is this woman? And they go, well, that's Ruth. And this gentleman named Boaz mm -hmm. says, is that the young lady that's helping Naomi? They said, yeah, that's her. Folks, you may think that nobody is noticing the good that you do, but God does. So Boaz says, well, tell you what, you leave her handfuls of the good grain for her to pick up. So while she started the day just randomly picking one piece at a time, a little bit here and there, now Boaz is having his people drop whole clumps. So her hands are just absolutely bursting with the amount of wheat she has at the end of the first day. So she goes back to, to see Naomi. And, and Naomi goes, what, what happened? And she goes, well, I happened upon the field of Boaz. And you gotta understand something, folks. This is fields as far as the eye can see, owned by hundreds, if not thousands of Jewish men. And she happened upon the field of Boaz. Well, go back to earlier in the story where I said that if, you know, since a woman had no real income of her own, they would have to get married off for, for provision, for protection. And that's when Naomi goes, Boaz, you just happened upon the one man who can marry you and protect the two of us? Folks, understand something. When you're following close to God, when you are living, seeking first the kingdom of God, miracles just kind of fall out of nowhere. And if, and if a Christian tells me they haven't seen a miracle, I usually have to stop and go, well, that's probably not on God. Because if you're following God close, you're going to be shocked at all the things that just get dropped into your path, just like her with the handfuls of wheat. So the story goes on. Naomi says to her, okay, well, the harvest ends in a couple days. And Boaz is going to be partying. And so here's what you need to do. You need to go at the end of the party when Boaz is basically drunk off his gourd. And you need to uncover his feet. Feet. And you need to just sit there until he wakes up. Once again, the Bible is reporting, not endorsing, okay? Okay. His feet is a euphemism. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so Boaz wakes up, and here's a beautiful woman just sitting there waiting. And he says, no, we're going to do this the right way. And he goes through the process to make sure that he can legally marry Ruth and then receive Naomi as a mother-in-law. Now, folks, here's the part you have to get. I really want you to catch this. Do you remember the story when Naomi, when Ruth was picking up handfuls of grain, mm -hmm. and when she was just getting the little scraps because she was gleaning? Do you remember that part? Get this. She was gleaning in a field God meant for her to own. Yes. Because when she married Boaz, what happened? She became. Owner. She owned the field that she used to be picking up scraps in. Folks, you may feel right now that your life is just randomly picking up scraps here and there, but if you keep following Jesus, he has a bigger plan for you than just picking up leftovers from other people. He wants you to own the very field that you're just barely surviving in. Well, three of you think that's awesome, but that keeps me awake at night excited. Amen? And when Jesus got to heaven... He looked for this Moabite woman, this woman who did not grow up in Judaism. And what did he call her? Booba. Booba. Ruth was one of Jesus' grandmothers. Is that awesome? Yes. Yes. But there's one more. Remember I talk about how the Bible, the Old Testament, has no problem telling you the problems of some of their heroes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is the big one. This is a story about David and Uriah. You may want to call it David and Bathsheba, but you have to understand something. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Bathsheba was wrong on any level. 
It's always about David. Yes. The whole story starts off in the spring when the kings usually go to war. To war David sent the army out. He sent Joab. And if you look at the story kind of carefully and you do a little research, to me, it kind of looked like David was trying to figure out how to get Uriah out of the way so he could get to his wife. If you do a little bit of background, you realize David's number one advisor was a man named Antithophel. Antithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. Yes. So there's a very good chance David watched Bathsheba grow up. There was almost an absolute chance David would have been there when she was bat mitzvah. He certainly would have been there at Uriah's wedding because Uriah was the right-hand man of his right-hand man. Bathsheba is not some random woman. And by the way, it doesn't say anywhere in there that she was naked when she bathed. Today, women in the Middle East will still bathe and never get completely naked. It says David from the king's roof. David has the vantage point of the whole city. Could kind of see in to see her. And you kind of get the idea David has been planning this all along. So when he finally calls for Bathsheba, you have to understand something, folks. Bathsheba has zero power, and he's the king. And who knows what David would have said to Bathsheba. Sleep with me or else, dot, dot, dot. We know what he actually did. So who knows what he would have threatened. Hello? She had no power. She had no control. There was nothing she could do. So David and Bathsheba have sex. Bathsheba winds up getting pregnant. So David has to go into emergency mode. So he brings home her husband. He says, Uriah, great to see you, brother. You're doing such a great job. Go have a nice evening with your wife. Go on. Come on. Go on there. And Uriah says, how in the world can I go sleep with my wife when the armies of God are on the battlefield? David calculate. So then David goes, I know what I'll do. I'll get him schnuckered. So he gets Uriah completely ripped. And he says, go, stagger home. See your wife, go. And Uriah says, through his drunkenness, how can I go be with my wife when the ark of God is on the battlefield? Now, Four chapters earlier, who was the person who was really crazy about the Ark of God? David. David. So finally, David puts a note in Uriah's hand, sends him out to the battlefield. And the note says, charge the enemy, put Uriah in the front of the lines, and when Uriah is in the heat of the battle, have everybody run away so that Uriah gets killed. And he does. The greatest hero of Israel killed the husband. Of the, one, of the woman he and Christ. See, this is part of the reason why I believe the Bible is true, because they have no problem. This, every time you read Psalms, I mean, these are, a lot of these are coming from David. So the story goes on. The child that she's carrying is born weak, and David prays like crazy for the child to survive, and the child doesn't. But later on, David and Bathsheba fall in love. The reason we know this is history, not necessarily the Bible. History records Bathsheba as being David's wife. Now, did he have multiple wives and multiple concubines? Of course he did, because that was the custom. But history records his wife as being Bathsheba. Because eventually, they have another child who lives. Then they have another child named Nathan. They have another child named Solomon. You've heard the name Solomon, haven't you? Okay, well, here's what happens. After Solomon is born and David is getting old and decrepit and about to die, Bathsheba looks at all of David's kids and realizes none of them are godly except for Solomon. And she wisely politics Solomon to be the next king, as opposed to Antithope, not Antithope, uh, Absalom, who tried to take over the kingdom, who slept with David's wives, just another highly ungodly person. Bathsheba was the one to make sure that Solomon was made king. Solomon becomes king, and guess what he does? He builds a throne for his mother, yes. and he places it on his right hand. What does that mean? That means that his mom was his main advisor. Yes. 
What does the world know about Solomon? He's King Solomon the Wise. And who was his main advisor? His mother. His mom. Bathsheba becomes the second most powerful woman in all of Middle Eastern history. Second only to a little known person named Cleopatra. Yes. And then ultimately, remember I said they had other sons? Nathan? Mm -hmm. Nathan's family line goes down to Mary. Solomon's family line goes down to Joseph. Joseph. Both of Jesus' genetic family members have a common ancestor in David and Bathsheba. Now, there's 400 years separated, so don't think there's anything too weird going on. But, but you know why this is important? We call David the, the, the son of David. I'm sorry, we call Jesus the son of David. But what do we have to add to that? Son of Bathsheba. Son of David and Bathsheba. Here's a woman who turned her desperation when she had absolutely nothing. She still kept going back to God. She knew when to speak up. She knew when to be silent. She just trusted God. And she became the second most powerful woman in all of Middle Eastern <coughs> history. And not only when Jesus got to heaven, did he call Bathsheba Buba yes. from one side of his family. He called her Buba from the other side of his family. She was his grandmother on both sides. And once again, in the story of Bathsheba, we have a perfect example that it doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you finish. Amen? Amen. Is this good news to anybody here but me? Yeah. You've had kind of a wild ride of a life and you're trying to figure out, okay, where are we going with this? Well, guess what? You're still in the right place. But I'm not done. <laughs> Have you ever wondered? Well, you probably haven't until today. But don't you think it's kind of odd that Matthew, who's about to tell the story of Jesus, goes through the genealogy like any good Jewish man would do and brings up these four women? I mean, there's plenty of godly women in the Old Testament he could have alluded to. Don't you think it's kind of odd that he picks out Four women who have sexually interesting circumstances. Right? Plenty of women he could have talked about. Why did he talk about these four? Well, I want you to look down in your Bible into verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus... Who is called Christ. Why does Matthew take all this time to bring out these four women in sexually unique circumstances? Because he's going to tell you about one more woman who's going to have a sexually unique circumstance. Yes. Mary. He goes, I, I want you to remember our history. And all of these women are part of the lineage of Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you one more story. And that one's really going to knock your socks off. But you have to know. It doesn't matter where you start. It only matters where you finish. Amen? Amen. But I'm not done. Do you really want to know <laughs> why I think Matthew also went through this whole thing? Grab your Bible, or maybe you can see it from here. Whose name is at the very top of the page? Matthew. Matthew. Anybody here have a Bible that calls him St. Matthew? Or grew up with a King James Bible that says St. Matthew? Yeah. Yeah. Was Matthew always a saint? No. Uh, he was a tax collector. Matthew was a tax collector. We have nobody in our society who is as hated as a Jewish tax collector. Jewish tax collectors would be hired by the Romans. They would have Roman guards at their beck and call, and they would go into their own neighborhoods collecting taxes for the Romans. Now, if that's not bad enough, guess how they made their income? By charging extra. Yep. So if you owe 10, 
Matthew would come to your neighborhood. And remember something, folks. You grew up with Matthew. You know his parents. You know his siblings. He would go in there with a legion of Roman guards. And even though you only owed 10, he would take 15. And if you didn't, and if you didn't respond, Roman guards would beat the Gorgonzola out of you at Matthew's behest. Matthew is telling you these stories of four women who didn't start off well, but certainly ended well. Why? Because he didn't start off well. But he certainly ended well. Is that good news? So if you're here today and you have a couple circumstances in your life where you're not so proud of them, here's the great news. You are only one or two good, consistent decisions from radically turning your life around. Amen. Today can be the first day of the greatest season of your life. Amen. Did, did you catch that? Yes. Today could be the first day of the greatest season of your life. Amen. Where everything you've been through gets radically turned around. How does it happen? You learn to make good choices. The only thing in life you control is your choice to step closer to Jesus or not. And if you're a control freak, I'm really sorry. But the tighter you grip, the farther it gets ripped away. The only, the only good thing you have control of is your choice to step closer to Jesus or not. And we see this story of ladies who consistently step closer to Jesus. And even though they didn't start well, they ended up being Jesus' grandma. Is that good news? Amen. Lord, in your name, we are just grateful that you do redeem everything. And we are just thankful, Jesus, that even if we haven't started well, we can end well. And today, Lord, we decide that we are going to end well and that we are going to make decisions and we're going to step closer to you every day of our life. And you will empower us and you will strengthen us. And everybody look up really quick because next week I get to preach my favorite message. Which one? Bad boys. <laughs> the rest of the Bible are bad boys in the, in the Bible. Well, no, no. Next week, we're going to talk about what do you do when you make all the right, when you're doing all the right things and getting all the wrong results. Anyone been there before? Yeah. All right, well, that's next week. All right, God bless you. We'll see you Tuesday night and Friday night. Bye.